if you've been around this church very long at all, you know that uh, I love my family. We have two sons. They've married two Christian daughters, and they've given us three grandchildren. Well, my youngest son, or my, our youngest son, my wife and I, our youngest son, he was always full of energy, and he was always strong-willed. And uh, my wife would say he's like his dad, but we're not going to get into that discussion. But, um, you know, he, there, there, there was many good attributes about him, but one of the things that he always loved to do was pick on his dad. Whatever I did, he always tried to find a way to, to pick on his dad. And so I would tell him as he was growing up, I, I'm going to pray that when you grow up, that you're going to have a son just like you. And so about 12 years ago, in the month of June, he was married to the lady that is now his wife, and I was officiating the wedding ceremony. And in the middle of the ceremony, I said to Aaron, who was about to be my daughter-in-law, I just want to warn you, Aaron, that I have been praying for years that John would have a son just like him. And so you're not just, just getting John, you're going to have a son that is just like him. Well, sure enough, eight years ago, <clears throat> about a month before my wife and I moved here to Bethlehem, our first grandchild was born, a grandson, his name was Colton, and he is like his daddy in every way. He looks like his daddy. I thought about putting pictures up here when my son was eight and now my grandson's eight and what they look like. I mean, just in every possible way. He's strong-willed, and yet he's just the most loving kid uh, that, that you could possibly want. Uh, when his dad was in kindergarten, we, uh, were, we took a, a road trip, and his teacher sent home a workbook of math problems for him to work on while we were traveling. Now my son, or excuse me, my grandson, uh, whose mother is a teacher, they finished school this week, but his mother has to work a few extra days. And so while she is doing her work, she gives him a, an iPad with a math app on it, and he sits there all day long and works on math problems. I mean, he is just, just in every way. I mean, I could spend the whole amount of time I have for, for the sermon telling you about the likenesses, like father, like son. Well, God wanted us to know about him. Now, he had sent prophets, and we're going to talk about that, and he had, had them write their word and preach, preach the word and all those kinds of things. But he, when he really wanted us to grasp who he was, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, he, he wanted us to know him through Jesus. Now, my grandson is like his dad, but he's not his dad. Um, there were times that, that my wife and I prayed and prayed and prayed for his dad. Uh, when he was only about four or five years old, I said to my wife, I said, we really need to pray for John because he, he has no middle of the road. He's either all out for one thing or one, all out the other way. And I said, he is either going to turn the world upside down for Jesus or he's going to be in prison, one or the other. We really, need to, we really need to pray for him. Well, thank the Lord he got through all that, and he's 35 years old, never been inside the prison. So I thank, thank the Lord for that, and he is uh, uh, working hard in the local church where he serves as, as a layman today and, and uses his influence in many ways for the Lord. But Colton is eight years old. He's got a lot of choices to make. And so it's back to praying for Colton that he'll make wise decisions. I, I tell my daughter-in-law that uh, Jane prayed a lot of women out of John's life uh, before <laughs> we finally settled on Aaron. And uh, so we got a lot of praying to do for Colton. But, but with God... God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit together make what we call the Trinity. Now, the Trinity is not a word that you find in the Bible itself. It's a, th a theological term to describe God. He's three persons in one. 
But the Bible does show many places where God the Father, God the, the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are together. One is the baptism of Jesus, where the Father speaks. Jesus is in the water being baptized, and the Holy Spirit descends as a dove upon him. And there's other places in Scripture that says that. But as we look at the book of Hebrews, which is what we're going to do over the next several weeks, is to look at the book of Hebrews, we are, we are seeing God revealing himself to us. He wants us to know him. And in the Old Testament, he was hidden. He was veiled. Uh, there were all kinds of symbols, but he sent Jesus into the world. And, and we want to look at the Son like no other. We, we love our children. We love our grandchildren. And, and we might all have many me's out there. You know, you, you might be laughing at my story about my son and grandson because you're thinking of your own children and your own grandchildren, perhaps, uh, that, uh, that are like that. Or maybe your uh, previous generation said that about you. But uh, we want to look at the son like no other, Jesus Christ, the son of God. And as we look at Hebrews chapter 1, we see, first of all, that he alone is perfect. There's never been a person, a human being, born into this world who is perfect except for Jesus Christ. And we, the Hebrew writer begins by saying that Jesus is God's perfect spokesman. In Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through him, who, and through whom he made the universe. And so the Son of God uh, is, is set forth. And he says that in the past, God spoke through, to our forefathers through the prophets, at many times in many ways. God spoke... God's perfect revelation was given through imperfect people over a period of thousands of years. The, the prophets were just human beings. The apostle Peter refers to that, how they were, they were just human beings. And so the perfect revelation of God came to us through imperfect people, the prophets. And also God spoke through many events, pilgrimages like Abraham and, and Sarah leaving their father and, and, and moving out. Um, the children of Israel in the Exodus, the pilgrimage into the promised land. Uh, through floods, like Noah's flood, through wars, many wars. The, the book of Joshua is full of how Israel went in to conquer the Canaan land. Ma through miraculous signs and angelic appearances and through captivities and deliverances, through blessings and disasters. In many times, in many ways, we have recorded in the Old Testament how God spoke his revelation, revealed himself to us through imperfect people, but a perfect message of who he is that he gave to us in the Old Testament. And so, the Hebrew writer is pointing these people, he's writing to Hebrews, he's, he's writing to Jewish people. They were very familiar with the Old Testament. And so when he says that he spoke through the prophets in, in, uh, many, at many times and in various ways, the old, the old Testament that they had learned from their childhood would, would come to their mind. And then he says, but in these last days, in these last days, and, and I want to pause in this message for a moment and talk to you about those words, but in these last days. Now, what are the last days? Some people say we are living in the last days because of certain events that are happening. But Jesus said in the past, God spoke through prophets and through many ev different events but in these last days, he has now spoken through Jesus Christ. And so from the time of Christ's birth and his ministry and his death and burial and resurrection and his ascension into heaven, all the way through the rest of human history, it is all the last days. And it's always appropriate that back through the ages of the church, we have always been looking for Jesus Christ for from the time that Christ 
came into the world and then left the world and the Holy Spirit came into the world. We have been in the church age since the day of Pentecost and it's all the last days. And, and we have a tendency to want to fix that on, well, like in a week, Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday, that's the early days. And then Friday and Saturday are the last days of the week. That isn't what he's talking about. He's talking about the last age of the world. From the time Christ came until human history ends is all the last days. And, and I just want to, I have a concern, and I just want to share it with you. Uh, some of you have been Christians for a long, long time. And you may say, well, I, I don't need your concern, or I don't need you to tell me anything. But, but God has called me to pastor this church and to shepherd this church. And I'm concerned that we do not get carried away with modern day theories of prophecy that are nothing short of false prophet, prophecy. And those who proclaim it are something, nothing short of false prophets. If we prophesy something and it doesn't come to pass, then we are false prophets because we prophesied something that was very false. And in Jesus' own words, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 36, it says, No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. He was talking about when, when he would return, when the end of the age would be. And he said, no one knows except the Father. And so if you watch a television program, or you read a book, or you see some kind of a video, or you go to an arena, and somebody says, oh, I know when he's coming, this means this, and this means that, and because this happened and that happened, then Jesus is coming after this, and they have it all figured out, I've got news for you. It's false. Jesus himself said, no one knows the time or the day that he is coming. And then he goes on in that context and he says, when he does come, it's going to be as in the days of Noah. In other words, he said there'll be marriage and giving and marriage. And all the, it, it, in other words, it's going to be normal. People are going to be practicing their normal lives. But it will be days of evil and days of faithlessness. God tried to find more people to put on the ark, and he could only find Noah and his family. Uh, the only other people that, or the other, only other beings that were worthy of being on the ark were the animals. Noah and his family were the only ones that made it. The, the world was faithless. It was evil at that time, and they were caught unaware by the flood. Had they had any inkling of what was about to happen, they would have not only got on the ark, they'd have helped Noah build the ark. But they were totally unaware of what was about to happen to them. And then in Matthew 24, 42, at the end of that context, he says, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. We're to be looking for, there's nothing wrong with looking for the Savior to come. He promised he's coming. Every believer in every age should be looking for him to come. We just don't know when it is. So we have to always be prepared. He, he, he compares it to having your house ready. You know, there used to be a time in the United States of America that you could leave your house and you could leave your doors open. You could go to bed at night without your, your doors and windows locked, but those days are long behind us. Because we don't know when a thief might try to come. We don't know when someone might come to try to hurt our family. So we always lock the doors. We always lock the windows. And if you don't, you should. And if we're looking for Jesus Christ, we should always be ready for him to come. Well, how are we going to be ready? Well, Jesus tells us that too in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 46. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. When's he coming? When we don't expect him. Not when we have it all figured out and we can tell everybody, well, he's coming after this event or uh, at this particular time. No, he's coming when we do not expect him. Who then is faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge 
of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time, it will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. In other words, what he's saying is, when he returns, he wants us to be doing what he told us to do. Well, what did he tell us to do? Matthew 24, 25 talks about when he returns. Matthew 28, he gives the great commission. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all nations. In Acts chapter 1, verse uh, 6, the disciples say, does this mean that you're going to set up the kingdom of God now? And in verse 7, he says, it's not for you to know those things that are put in the Father's hands. And in verse 8, he says, when you receive the Holy Spirit, you will receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So what are we going to be doing? If we are really watching for the Savior, we should be fulfilling the Great Commission. We should be living as witnesses for Jesus Christ. We should not be trying to figure out when he's coming. We shouldn't be supporting people who've tried to figure out who he's coming. Some of these people have been saying that Jesus is coming since the 60s and they use every little thing that happens in the news to prove he's coming next week, but next week comes and he hasn't come for 40 years. When are we going to stop supporting these kinds of people and just do what Jesus told us to do to be his witnesses and to build his kingdom to to go into the world and to reach the, the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ? And then he goes on and he says that Jesus is the perfect spokesman. He has spoken to us by his son. God has spoken to us by his son. And he has appointed him heir of all things and through whom he made the universe. And so we see that the equality with God and the son, they are one and the same. God created the universe. He created the universe with his son, uh, Jesus, who is also God He is the Son of God. Jesus is the Word. God has spoken. There is none other. We can only point to Jesus. Even the Holy Spirit reminds us of what Jesus said. In John chapter 15, verse 26, Jesus is talking to his disciples about uh, when he goes back to the Father. And he said, the Holy Spirit will come. And here's, here's what Jesus said. In John 15, 26, when the counselor comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. Even the work of the Spirit is to testify about Jesus Christ. He is the perfect spokesman, and there is none other. God's glory, his being, and power all reside in in Jesus Christ. Jesus died on the cross and was buried and he rose again. He ascended to the throne of God and sat down, indicating that his work was completed. He had done all that the Father had told him to do and he sat down with the authority of God upon the throne of God. And not only is he God's perfect representative, he's also God's perfect savior. In Hebrews 1, 3, it says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful powerful word. After He had provided purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. We we recall in the Old Testament where Moses said, "I I want to see you, God. Reveal yourself to me. And God said, If you saw me, you would die. And he would not allow Moses to see his full glory. But in Jesus Christ, the Hebrew writer says, that we see the full glory of God in the person of Jesus Christ. He came, he provided purification for our sins, and Christ alone is is able to offer salvation to sinful humanity. In 2 Corinthians 5, verse 21, it says, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's what we remembered this morning in Holy Communion, is that Jesus came and became our substitute and offers for us the opportunity to become like him. He became like us so that we can become like him. The second thing then that we want to notice is that he alone is preeminent. 
Preeminence is not a word that we typically use, and so I'll describe it a little bit. It just means that he's above all others, that there's no equals, there's nobody above him. He's above everything. He is preeminent. He's preeminent as the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter 1, verses 4 through 6, it says, So he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son, today I have become your father, or I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. The son of God is preeminent. He's above all of the angels. Uh, back in, in the time of the New Testament, they had problems with some who wanted to worship angels. And sometimes we, we border on that sometimes in, in, in the exaltation of, of angels. Jesus Christ is far above the angels and all God's, God's angels worship the Son. When we see the angels revealed in the Old and New Testament, their direction is faced toward the throne of God and they are worshiping God and, and, and lifting him up. The only time that they ever look toward the earth is when they are on a specific assignment that God gives them to reveal God to us. But they are not above Jesus. He is above all. And then he is also sovereign of the universe. I've put in, in the slides of Hebrews chapter 1 verses 7 through 14. I'm not going to read all of that uh, if uh, Benrick would just kind of scroll through that on the screen slowly as I, I'm just going to kind of give an overview. He says that angels come and go. He, he says they're like the wind. They're like a flame of fire. They're here and then they're gone. They're, they really disappear fast when you put them together. You have a flame of fire and a wind. The wind is gone and the flame is gone. And, and that's the descriptive word that the Hebrew writer uses about angels. But God is on an everlasting throne. It, it is a throne that is forever and ever. He holds in his hand the scepter of righteousness. Oh, to have our world ruled by righteousness instead of people's opinions and, and, and what we want and what we think, but by the scepter of righteousness. And he is anointed with the oil of joy. He laid the foundations of the earth. He, he created this world. And uh, the heavens are the work of his hands. You think of the majesty of, of this world and, and how great it is. My wife and I had the opportunity last weekend to visit Niagara Falls while we were in the Buffalo area for our denomination's general conference. And it's just amazing. I mean, that's just one small part of God's creation. But the the boat just takes you right up along the edge and you can almost feel the power of that water as it hits the rocks and the mist rises and the beauty. And that's, that's not even the tip of, it, of God's little finger to create something like it. He's created the entire universe, the, the earth and, and the sky and, and all of the heavens. He has created it all. And, and in refer, reference to these created things, it says the earth and the heavens will perish, but the sun will remain. The, the earth and the heavens, they will be rolled up like a robe, changed like a garment. Uh, it, 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 it's so temporary. It's kind of like the clothes that you put on this morning, hopefully, are not the clothes that you'll put on tomorrow morning. I mean, that's none of my business either. But, uh, you know, it, it, that's how temporary that, uh, g- that God views the earth in comparison to his great majesty. But the sun will remain the same and never end. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, again, it says, Then how shall we escape if we ignore such a great salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. I've tried and struggled to try to put into words a picture of this great Son of God and His perfection. But words fail. And our minds fail to comprehend the greatness of God. Our minds fail to, to comprehend the, the majesty of Jesus Christ as, as He is so preeminent. But I want you to know this morning that the Holy Spirit of God can speak to your heart. And what 
I may not have been able to say and what you may not have been able to comprehend, the Holy Spirit of God can speak to your heart and tell you. Uh, Chris T- uh, Tomlin wrote a song that kind of puts this all together and helps us perhaps to understand it a little better. He said, he became sin who knew no sin, that we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus, Messiah, Lord of all. His body, the bread, his blood, the wine, broken and poured out for all for love. The whole earth trembled and the veil was torn. Love so amazing, love so amazing. Jesus, Messiah, name above all names, blessed Redeemer, Emmanuel, the rescue for sinner, the ransom from heaven. You might listen to those words, you might listen to this message and you say, you know, that, you, know you talked a lot about theological things and theological words and, and meanings and all this God talk is so above me. I, I wanted to share a video here at the end of a testimony of three ladies and none of them are in the room night, right now. Maria must be in the uh, nursery and uh, the other Maria is working and Ruby has a family issue that she's not here today. But three ladies who came to know Christ through Calvary Wesleyan Church. And uh, I just want to show their testimony. If you think that this is too big for you, serving this God is too great, you don't understand it, I want to share three ladies who just ordinary human beings who have grasped the love of Jesus Christ in their life. When I first started coming to Calvary Westland, it must have been like 2000, I came as a volunteer and I was in and out of the church. I mean, I know God and all that, but I wasn't like dedicated to it. And a few years ago, I was in a situation, I got married and I still came to church, but that's as far as it went. And after I got separated from my husband, and it became bad. I started drinking. Like three years later, I made the decision to say, this is it. I said, God, I'm surrendering ever to you. Tell me what I need to do. So I came back to the church. I started getting into Bible studies and recommitted my life to Jesus again. I got baptized, and from then on, my life started changing. And it was changing without me even realizing that I was changing it, you know, and I would say, oh wow, I'm not doing that anymore. I kept going to church and something didn't feel right. I felt like I was carrying a burden on my shoulders. And that Sunday there was a cross in front of the church and Pastor Dry called anybody that had a burden to come down and leave it at the cross. And I, I wanted to but didn't, but something kept pushing me because I, 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 I knew I had to make that decision. So I made that decision, and I came at the cross. And literally, I lost it, because I felt so ashamed. I, I felt like I was living a thorough life, you know? And nobody knew it, but God did. So he was the one that was telling me, pushing me, you need to make that decision. And from then on, I could totally say that, yes. I haven't regret making my decision, giving my life over. And I pray that I'm living up to his expectation. I'm not saying that it's not easy because every day is a challenge because things happen in your life, you know, that you don't expect. I'm more at peace with myself. I accept these situations as they come. I don't take things literally personally anymore. And if I do, I pray about it before I open my mouth. So before I open my mouth or I'm in a situation where I see people around me like that, either I give my positive input or I just walk away because you know, you don't wanna hurt somebody's feelings. So I try to do, think what, what would Jesus do in a situation like that? It, it's amazing that how long I've been at this church, you know, and now everybody knows me. 
I love my church. I'm Maria Orlana, and I have been made new. Started coming to Wesleyan Church uh, a little over a year, um, faithfully since May. Um, and due to Maria, Maria Rayano, uh, I used to work with her, and she invited me here. And ever since then, it's amazing. Amazing experience. I've been following Jesus faithfully since last May. I went through real hardship uh, about that time. Um, saw myself going homeless, and I yelled out, and I yelled out, I trust you God, I trust you God, and I never stopped. Changes I've seen in my life since I've been following my Lord, I'm not afraid anymore. I feel more joy, more peace. I can't see myself. Without him, waking up every day thanking him. My name is Ruby Morero, and I've been made new. I was talking to my sister about coming to church, and at first my heart was there, but not 100%. And she's like, Come on, it's an amazing church. And I just said one Sunday that I was going, and I did, and I felt at home. I became a follower of Jesus. Um, not right away when I came in. I wanted to see and feel how comfortable I was gonna be here. Um, so when I dedicated myself to the Lord was four months, five months, uh, right before the holidays. Um, I said, you know, Lord, I just wanna get closer to you. I wanna feel free, that's what I said. A couple of days after, me and Ruby got into a car accident in December. And I said to myself, I said, Lord, this could have been a whole lot worse. But knowing that we carry his faith in us, I knew that we were gonna be fine. And ever since that, he's just been my medication every day. I have changed from my children, my home. I dedicate myself more to the Lord. I speak to him. I let him know when I'm upset. It's amazing being close to him because you feel like you have a close friend, a best friend. I am Maria Marrero and I have been made new. Well, what does all this mean? The great, incomprehensible God who created everything made himself known to us through Jesus Christ. And right here, right now, in 2016, he can make a difference in your life and in my life. He's made a difference in so many other people's lives. And if you're here today and you do not know Jesus as your personal Savior, I would encourage you today to ask him to forgive your sin and to tell him that you want to follow him the rest of your life. If we just bow our heads for prayer, I'm going to close the service with prayer, and I'm going to include in that closing prayer a prayer of repentance and turning to Jesus Christ. And if you mean this in your heart and you pray and say, yes, Lord, that's me, that's what I need, you can leave this place to know today knowing that Jesus is your Savior, and you can give the rest of your life in following after him. Shall we pray? Our dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you this morning for your late great love and mercy to us. You went to great lengths in the Old Testament to tell us about yourself and to reveal yourself in many imperfect people and in many different events and situations. But in these last days, you sent Jesus Christ to live among us and to die for us. He rose victorious from the grave and ascended to heaven and is at the Father's right now, hand right now interceding for us. And your Holy Spirit is in this place. And Lord, I believe that you have spoken to some people this morning who have never made a decision to follow you. And I trust that they will pray this prayer with me in their heart. Dear Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I confess my sins to you. I was born in sin. I was born separated from God. I have committed acts of sin. I have made sinful choices. But today I repent. I turn from my sin and I turn to you. And I ask you, dear Jesus, to forgive my sin and to be my Savior. And I choose this day 
to begin a life of following Jesus. And I decide today that I am going to follow you the remainder of my life. Lord, I pray for all who have prayed this prayer, and Lord, that they would know that Jesus has forgiven their sin and that they would begin to follow you. And then, Lord, I pray for all of us who know you as Savior. You have given us a commission. You have given us a mission. You have given us a purpose, and that is to reach lost people with the gospel of Jesus Christ and to help them to grow into disciples of yours. Lord, may we give ourselves totally to that. So in that day when you come again, that we will be ready, not because we predicted the day or the time that you're coming, but because we are ready, because we are building your kingdom. We are sharing your salvation with others. May you be glorified today, we pray, in every way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.